So we decided to rearrange things and we're going straight to this talk asking for help with supercomputers. Um, yeah, which... basically like uh, like uh, we noticed that like maybe uh, like we have had this discussion of how do you ask admins for uh, applications and such, such stuff and how do you discuss with the admins uh, uh, rel related to uh, the problems you're having. And, and basically this flows really nicely into Radovan's topic, which is like, how do you ask for help uh, with supercomputers? Because yeah. this is uh, like having this kind of a uh, same lab and this like easy way of getting uh, the issues solved is, is very important. Yeah. So Radovan, are you here? Yes. 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 Video. Yeah. So Radovan is works at the University of Tromso in Norway, a lot like um, us at Alto. Um, and he does, well, I guess his title is research engineer or senior engineer or something like that. But anyway, he's I know him from Code Refinery and a lot of other similar joint projects we've been doing among the Nordics. Um, let's see. So someone, I'm getting reports that actually now the Twitch stream is not working, but it is working for me. Uh, before we go on, how about we have a quick poll here? Can you answer if Twitch is working for you or not? Well, that's a lot more yeses than noes. So I guess let's go on. Yeah, um, I, I, I can recommend that you try refreshing the stream. It might, there might be some something that happens like if if you refresh, that usually helps. Yeah. And also, if you have some ad blocker or something that might uh, interfere sometimes, uh, yeah. you're not get getting any <laughs> money from ads if they're showing you them. But yeah, uh, but yeah the, like they might interfere with the stream. OK. So well, let's continue. So yeah, so Radovan, when we were talking about this workshop, we were we made a call, like, does anyone else want to present something? Radovan had this talk on how to ask for help with supercomputers, which actually provides a lot of insight into the thought process behind us. So he's here to present to us. So your slides are now visible. And yes, please. Okay, hi everybody on on stream and recording, and hi Richard and hi Simo. Thanks so much for having me here. Really nice to be part of this HPC Summer Kickstart. So I will share some slides. My understanding is that we have like 20 minutes time, but let's also have a discussion. Questions, welcome. The slide deck, you find a link to the slide deck also in the, in the HackMD. And as Richard said, I'm uh, not working in Finland, I work in Norway, but we have many things in common we have many projects in common we collaborate on code refinery so maybe maybe I actually go to the next slide which is just a tiny slide about me so we work together on the code refinery project i have worked in past on research so i'm coming from the theoretical chemistry side but the last five six years i've been mostly working in high performance computing doing support in sweden and norway I'm working on research software engineering, teaching programming, and really trying to help researchers with computing and programming. And I think I do really similar work as, as you've seen today, yesterday, but in, in Norway. So in Norway, we have the Sigma 2 Meta Center, which is, um, which is an organization com composed of five organizations across all Norway, where we support research and we do high performance computing. And, in this presentation, so this is a talk that I've given a couple of I think months ago in Norway, but I think it's also really relevant here. It's about 
it's about discussing how can we write support requests, questions, so that you get quick answers and useful answers. And also how do how should we answer them? So this is not only for not only for the users, but this is also for the staff because it's a dialogue. And and hopefully what we will discuss will be a useful guide. And it's not meant and hopefully it doesn't come across as you know, do this, don't do that, and this is how you should do things. It's a process we all are learning. And yeah, hopefully it's useful. Looking forward to questions. I will try to watch here on, on how can be, but uh, Richard will also highlighting questions and points. So um, just as a starting point, this is about improving your experience with the system. So we've tried on systems in at Alto systems in Finland, but also maybe systems, Nordic systems later when you scale up. And as I said, it's not only for users. In fact, I would like to also create like a slide deck and training material for staff, because I think we should have training also for staff on how to support users. And also there, at least in, in the institution where I work, I mean, there's definitely room for improvement. <clears throat> so let's get started. Uh, first, some credit. I would like to thank uh, my colleague Bjorn Helge from from Oslo, but also Richard and the Code Refinery team. This is based on really a couple of discussions. I want to say that I've been working on both sides, both on the research side and the support side. So I think, although I'm definitely in my bubble, I, th I think I can still relate to, to both sides of the dialogue. And when we think about the two sides of asking questions, answering questions, I think it's it's really important to remember that on the other side, there is a human being when we ask and when we answer. And what do I mean by that is that when I'm now support staff and I'm getting a question through the, through the Triathlon issue tracker or through email, through chat, I should remember that it's, it's maybe not so easy to ask for help. I should remember that the person asking me for help has perhaps 20 years less experience with the command line, with Linux, with supercomputing. Also, the person on the other side has perhaps spent weeks uh, wrestling with this problem and maybe has waited days or weeks for my answer. So really important that we always remember to be respectful. So that's for the, that's for the support staff. Now, the it's also good for the users to know now this is now this is the situation in Norway or uh, that we actually rotate so the duty of who is answering these questions we are rotating so it may be different people on different weeks I don't know whether this is the same situation in Alto but it can happen that you know some person <clears throat> answers your question but another person picks it up a week later or two weeks later the people answering questions they don't know everything also, they may not be spending all their work time on the supercomputer either. So sometimes I'm helping researchers, users, students who spend more time on the computer, supercomputer than I do. So I don't know everything, but I'm trying to help. And also, as Seymour explained it nicely, uh, like half an hour ago, also I, I, I am then the middleman, and I'm, I'm also going out to Stack Overflow and look for answers. So I don't know everything. I may not know you. So when you ask me a question, I may not know you, we, we may not have the context, and it's good to create that context to be to give a helpful answer. Okay, moving on. When do you ask questions on in the supercomputing centers? And this is really common across basically all of them. There is some form of a ticketing system. So in, in Alto, this is a GitLab issue tracker, as far as I understand. Please correct me if this is wrong. In, yeah, that's in correct. Work. Yeah, so there, there is a ticket and it gets a number, and then there is a discussion thread. In in Norway, we get we get these requests via email, but also they open up a ticket on our side. So on our side, it looks very similar to how it looks in in Alto. So each of each of these tickets, issues, problems, questions gets a number, and then we try to have this conversation in this in this thread, and. Typically, each of these tickets will have an owner. 
so and, and this is somebody who's watching that this doesn't get forgotten and make sure that this is followed up. And this will be typically the person answering you on the other side, but the owner can change. And independently of whether this comes in as an email or whether this is an issue on GitLab, it gets a subject or a title. And this is the first thing that we see. And it's really useful if this is descriptive. So already that can help a bit. So here's an example for, for a subject which is not very useful, problem or help. Oh, because then, then we have to go in and read up on all the thread to find out what is it about. It's good if already by looking, I mean, like when we read emails, just by looking at the subject, I can get an idea of what the problem might be because then I can maybe, it makes it easier for me to locate the colleague who can help me answering this. Why is my job crashing is better. If it is a new problem, then create a new new issue on GitLab or a new email, new, new thread. So just because you've been in conversation, so maybe you've been working with a colleague at Alto Scientific Computing for the last two weeks, exchanging many emails, working on a problem, but now you see a new problem, it's really good to open a new issue and not reply to the to the unrelated conversation with this new question, because that makes it easy then easier for the staff to maybe somebody else can pick it up than the problem, or maybe somebody else knows more about the solution. And uh, if it is the same problem, then keep it on the thread. So reply to that email, reply to that issue thread, so that a discussion stays connected, because that makes it easier if if one. Uh, one colleague goes on vacation and somebody else picks it up and wants to wants to help, they have the whole conversation in one place. And it's not distributed across many different emails and threads and issues. Also helpful to, to give us context, um, like what is your username that can help. <clears throat> we can find it out uh, through your email, but it takes a couple of minutes. And <clears throat> also, um, if you, if you uh, discuss examples like my job is crashing, can you please have a look in, I have an example in this embed folder. Uh, very helpful if you can use explicit paths, so the full path to your example. Because here I can see who you are and I know how to find you. If you tell me that uh, you can find it in my home folder, then I have to first look where is the home folder. All that can be done. So explicit is better than implicit. If there are, sometimes there are more machines than one. So in Norway, we have, I don't know, four different uh, clusters, then it's good to say, which one is it then? Also tell us about your environment and what I mean by the environment, what modules, what modules have you loaded? Or if this is uh, like a Conda environment, what is the what are the dependencies? If you load some, environment, if you set some environment variables or modules in your like dot bash RC, I will come back to that later, please mention it because we, your computing environment may be different than mine. And then if I try to reproduce our example, it's good if we agree on the same environment. Yeah, sometimes text is better than a screenshot, but screenshot is also can be fine. Sometimes an attachment is better than a screenshot. So this context can be really helpful. Okay, looking at the time, we have maybe like 10, 15 minutes more to go. So now about let's let's talk about formulating the question. And here I have four really good questions to ask yourself. And I, I took them out from the help pages of Alto Scientific Computing. And I will say more about them in a bit. So one question, has it ever worked? So is this the first time that you try this or has it stopped working? And if it stopped working, well, what has changed between you know last week and today? Um, also tell us what you're really trying to accomplish and the goal, not, not only the current technical obstacle, but where do you want to get at? I will, I will come back to this. Uh, what did you do with this problem before sending this email or before opening this issue? Try to be reproducible. I will also come back to this. And what do you need from, from the spot? Do you need a complete solution or do you want to get some hints to get started? 
how about if the solution takes really long time? Do you want us to, that we recommend you thinking about other solutions first? So these can be really useful. Well, let's, let's drill a little bit into these questions. So about telling us what you have tried. Um, really useful to know is this, has it stopped working or has it ever worked? Because sometimes I'm getting like a request. Okay, I tried to do this on, I, I tried to run this on 30, on 30 cores and it doesn't work. But it, just by the question, it's not clear to me, well, did it work on 10 cores or eight cores or did it work on one core or has it never ever worked on this machine? So this context can be useful. If, if something is failing, does it, is it always failing or only sometimes? If it's always failing, it's, it may be easier to do that sometimes, but it may only randomly fail, but it can be good to know. Uh, have you tried to, to isolate and simplify the problem? And if yes, how, what have you tried? More about this in a slide or two. Also check the documentation on the web, but still good to not hesitate to ask because sometimes the web is wrong, especially when it's about installations, because sometimes the web, if you go on Stack Overflow and we check how should I install something, then Stack Overflow says, well, you do sudo apt-get install and that, that doesn't work on our cluster. So don't hesitate to ask either. And uh, this connects to this question of, please tell us what you really want to do at the end, not just the obstacle. And this is the so-called XY problem. So please tell us what you really want. And what is the XY problem? This is something that happens quite often. And, and that is that, so I, as a user, I want to achieve, I want to achieve X, whatever that is. Um, and now I think that, well, what do I need to do so that I can do X? Hmm, I'm thinking maybe searching the web and now I realize that I need to install software Y, for instance. So I need, I think I need Y so that I can solve this goal. And I have this goal in my mind, but I don't tell anybody. So it's in my mind, but the support staff doesn't know. So now I'm trying to do this, I know I'm trying to solve this problem why. I hit the problem and now I ask for help with why. And now we get a support issue and we have a conversation, lots of back and forth, many emails, many questions. After one week or three weeks, we finally resolve why, but after much interaction, only then we realize that, well, we solved something, but then we realize that what the user really wanted is X, but we didn't know because we, it was never mentioned. And, and maybe all, this, all the effort and the solution that we invested into why, it, wasn't maybe, it was maybe not even the right solution. So it's, my recommendation is, also communicate what you really want to, what is, what is your goal? Um, ask early, um, when you only know X, maybe you, you haven't tried Y yet, maybe. So let us know about the context. This can really help because maybe the, 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 the staff can guide you towards a completely different solution that you may not be aware of. But this goes also both ways, is there a comment? No. So this goes both ways, also for the staff. And uh, well, we have Richard coined this the reverse XY problem. Also for the staff, it's important that we, when we answer questions, that we ask ourselves, that we don't only answer what the users ask for, but that we also try to read a little bit between the lines and think deeper about what the user really needs or may need. And the user may not be aware of what they really need because they may not be aware of what exists. So it is also a task for the support staff to read a little bit between the lines and maybe suggest a different route or at least have this conversation. Okay, just pausing here to see whether any questions or comments coming up. So there's yeah, I, I will make a, one comment that is 
like right bang in the middle of the talk I, we didn't want to interrupt because the talk was really good but right bang in the middle uh it seems that the fastly uh like edge content delivery network uh is down so like uh, a big part of internet is down uh, in the whole world so so uh <laughs> twitch is down uh, where the stream is supposed to be but uh fortunately some uh in Zoom, uh, somebody uh, managed to apparently stream this uh, uh, this uh, talk still, uh, hopefully, uh, like uh, or Richard at least uh, recorded it in, in the future. But yeah, you were being yeah. trolled by the content <laughs> delivery network. So, so basically, uh, Twitch went down, Twitter is down, and uh, like ma major news organizations are down, Reddit is down, PayPal is down. Like Amazing. Uh, it's a bit of a bit of a mess apparently in the internet. Uh, so so uh, yeah, uh, this is a thing uh, to remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is this kind of a, like a situation where you're you're giving a talk when the bo bombs are falling. Like <laughs> okay, so that explains why my slides were not reloading on uh, on GitHub. I think. Yeah, yeah, is GitHub down as well? So what? Yeah, what do you like if you go to you? GitHub, uh, it, it looks pretty funny. Uh, like it doesn't. It it's basically HTML at least to me. Like so. So yeah, this is pretty interesting. So what is the recommendation? Should it be like boss and restart somehow, or, or? I think maybe we can keep going i think people in zoom can still watch and people that have already have it open can watch in any way it's recorded so mm. we'll make use of okay. it that way yeah no it's exciting <laughs> yeah okay so for those who did not stop the stream are still able to watch okay good good to know yeah okay great okay. And for those who still managed to watch thanks a lot for hanging on um and let's keep on going through this crisis yeah it, it, it's like a, a bit of a nice like has it worked before this kind of a like yeah. how to solve an error while the error is happening while you're talking about how to solve an error so yes. yeah this this is the kind of a situation where it's a uh, is uh, like uh, you need to immediately start debugging the situation when it happens but mm. good okay i will try to carry on um, a few more slides some recommendations on so this actually some uh, this is a recommendation on what to do when uh, when you are new on a, on a machine either new to supercomputers in general or you have been working on supercomputer one and now you are moving to supercomputer two and that is so first time on a new machine and the, the recommendation that I would like to discuss is something that I see very often, is to not start immediately with a gigantic job. And gigantic can depend on the context. So of course, if this is how big the cluster is, but here just to name some numbers. So don't immediately go for 60 nodes, 20 nodes, how many often, how many nodes, and not immediately for the 40 hour calculation, but instead, to to grow the calculation and i will discuss here a little bit why i think it's useful approach and also how that connects to to asking questions and reporting issues and and this is something i wish somebody had told me when i started on supercomputers which was maybe 2005 to to first calibrate my calculation and not immediately go for the big thing. So to start with uh, something small, a, sh a short five minute run on one core maybe. And once this is working, then go for more cores. And once this is working, then go beyond the one node. And then once this is working, increase the system size and make the calculation longer. And this is not what I used to do. Because I, when, when you start with these tiny, tiny calculations, they can be unphysical or the system size is like ridiculously small and has nothing to do with my research. But it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it's first about getting the, 
all these different parameters and and toggles right and then i can go for the real system so here a question to the audience but i'm not sure how much audience is left at the moment so maybe i can discuss it here so the, the question would be what are the advantages of this approach and i think this is a bit related to experimental research like if i would get an expensive instrument into my lab and the supercomputer is an, is a big complicated expensive ex instrument i would also not immediately go big and do try something very novel on it i would first calibrate it so this is about calibrating your job scripts the parameters and what is the advantage of it is that start simple and grow it because then you first of all it will take if there is a problem it will take less time until the problem appears so with the five minute calculation it will not queue forever it will queue for a couple of seconds then it will start and if i have a typo in my script i will immediately see it i don't have to wait for three days until i see that i have some really basic mistake also if i have a little bit less trivial mistakes in my input files in my script in my configuration by growing the calculation it will help me identifying them just by having a simple example and this can be also useful when you hit a problem so when i hit a problem it can be really useful to simplify the example so then you go the opposite way so then you make the you make the problem smaller and smaller and smaller because that can again help me identifying where the problem is it it can also it, it's also helpful for the staff because also the staff has to when they debug your problems they also have to queue and wait so if this so when you experience a problem try to create a small reproducible example it's not always easy it may not be always possible but it, it's a really good process which takes some time so create or uh, make the example fail as early as possible this simplifies debugging if you have an idea of how long it takes until it fails tell us that so if you know that this is crashing after half an hour it's really good to know again is this reproducible does it always happen does it only sometimes happen if it fails after two seconds then then in the job script don't ask for 48 hours because the job script doesn't know that it it will crash after two seconds and if you ask for many many hours the queuing system doesn't know that it will fail immediately and you may wait way too long in the queue for the job to start and to crash two seconds later all dependencies loaded in your script because then they are close to the calculation so I apologize i don't know i'm not sure whether this has been discussed it may be discussed later today or tomorrow but um, i recommend to not load dependencies in your dot bash rc really the right place is in the job script attach all necessary files if this is an interactive job uh, then it's useful if you can provide all the commands from login to the problem so so that i can reproduce them so from from the first login to the machine you can give me a recipe do this go to this folder then do module load this module load that now run this script and now you will see this happening and this recipe can be this can this can help the staff a lot otherwise we will have to do a lot of questions and answers to figure all this out okay very few more two more slides more well, why this small example because it it often just by making the example smaller it often simplifies the problem we remove variables and it can help us identifying the reason so just this process which can take some time can actually help us to to find the what the problem is we reduce the number of possible reasons also the shorter example is easier to debug and doesn't queue forever and having this small example i recommend to create one for you independently of whether you have a problem right now or not create a small example for you something that runs in five minutes 
something where you know the result and also where you know the timing. Because then next time something is happening with the machine and you are unsure, like, is this, my, is this me or is it them? You know, did I mess up something or is something or something happened with the cluster? Because then you can run your example, the example that you know very well. And if it crashes immediately, you know something happened on the machine. And if it takes now five times longer, then you know that maybe something happened with the file system. And this, then you can send this example to the, you can attach it to your issue and say that, look, this is, this is my example. I know it very well. It always works in five minutes. Now it doesn't. Please have a look. Something is wrong with your cluster. And that, that is also very, very helpful for the staff. So let me summarize, but hopefully we can have a discussion. Um, so when facing a problem, uh, spend a few minutes on it before writing the email or before opening the issue, because it can help improve the information and it can speed up the rest of the process. But also don't hesitate too long to ask. I think it's wonderful that uh, Auto Scientific Computing provides these, these garage sessions every day and really cool that this is available. So I would encourage everybody to pop in, ask questions there. Um, Many people don't know that you can you can actually install most software yourself, and the staff is will be happy to show you how because we really want to empower users to take control over the software installations. You don't need to be an administrator to install most of the software. Let's remember the XY problem both from both sides, both as users and the staff. Let's communicate what we really want, not only the immediate technical obstacle. I highly recommend to grow calculations before uh, when I when looking for problems, but also to find out how do they scale with system size. So don't go immediately for 250 cores, but grow it, grow the calculation and find out how does it grow when I add more and more processes to it. Create a small example for you. It will one day it will be very handy so that you can find out is this problem on your side or is it on the cluster side. Try to make problem examples short and reproducible. Thanks so much for listening. Do we have time for questions and are there any questions or comments? Yeah, let's see. Um, there are I get things adjusted. Yeah, so um, there is some questions on HackMD that were mainly about the, well, like about scaling jobs themselves, but we'll cover all of those things tomorrow. So that's not the main point here. I guess one question I have, it seems a lot of these are somehow about um, like complex computational jobs, like when you have the simulation all ready to go and you're running it. So how would you recommend people to ask for help at an earlier phase? Like when you're still, like before you're starting, should you ask for help? Hmm. Like Great if... question, and I recommend to. So there are no, there are no stupid questions. And, and again, good for the staff to re remember that many people are new to the terminal, new to the command line, new to Linux, new to all of this. It's good to to ask early, even before you have any scripts and any anything there, because that can also help you asking for the right resources. So uh, because often starting on a supercomputer is often connected to actually asking for compute time, how much storage, but you may not you may not really know. And you may not know, yeah. should I go for the CPU or the GPU? Mm -hmm. Should I go for this machine, that machine? So I would recommend to ask, yeah. hey, I have this problem, so that we, we, we can help directing you towards the right service mm -hmm. and towards the right resources to read. Yeah. One of the things I would like to have more of is sort of low threshold questions. Like, I'm about to do such and such. I don't need you to tell me a lot, but just point me to the right direction so I start reading 
reading the right things myself, and I can come back in a few weeks if I have questions, rather than spend a few weeks possibly doing the wrong thing and then um, coming and asking for help. But also at the same time, all these other things like the garages, the chats, and so on, these are good for these small questions, but they're not good for big questions. If you go on the chat and say, my code doesn't work, and try to answer it, the problem is we can either answer the question right away, or it's probably going to be forgotten and scrolled away, and who knows if we'll get back to it. So we'll also have a low threshold of directing you to the issue trackers or the other systems in order to um, to like keep track of the longer term things. So don't think that if we direct you to the tracker, that means the question was bad. It just means that we need to track it a different way. I mean, it's also okay to come to chat and say, I have a question about such and such. Is this a good question to ask? And if we say yes, then you send the email about it. Yeah, and also, is this like, is this a good place to ask that question? Uh, mm. Because there can be many different places. Mm -hmm. So then we can, uh, we can help directing where might be a good place. Yeah. Okay, so I don't see many other questions about this on the um, HackMD. The one, one interesting uh, like mention here was that like basically the XY problem uh, is like 